All right. Um, thank you everyone for joining this knowledge sharing session. Um, it's targeted to all indicators and institutions. My name is Durga Prasad and I'm the host for today's Fireside Chat. Right. Um, I know it's a very difficult time for everyone and things are not uh, same as they were during this disruption. Um, but in spite of that, you chose to join this session and it is truly remarkable and we really, really appreciate that gesture. Thank you once again. A right, couple of points before we get started. Um, this is a listen-only webinar uh, and the Q&A session will be in the last 15 minutes of this session. If you have any questions, please submit them you know, anytime during this uh, next 45 minutes by clicking on that questions icon on, your, on the right. And uh, we will take those questions uh, right after uh, our fireside chat is uh, completed. Okay, so let's get started. Um, to give you a brief introduction about me, uh, I've been with Amazon Internet Services uh, for the last three years, nine months, approximately, and with overall 20 years of experience in this uh, industry. So in my current role, I work with AWS customers in India, especially education customers such as uh, institutions, tech startups, research organizations, schools, partners, um, and etc. And uh, there are more than 11,000 education customers across the globe uh, using AWS. I am Bangalore, Triple IT Bangalore, Indian Institute of Science, Manipal, Global Services are some of the customers in India. So um, most of the customers they use, there are many use cases these customers use and choose AWS for, uh, such as campus management solutions, online learning, assessments, and et cetera. Uh, but today's topic is, um, how can technology ensure continuity in examinations and learning? That's the topic. And uh, I have two guests with me. Uh, one is uh, Professor uh, P.D. Jose from Indian Institute of Management, Bengaluru. He's the chairperson for digital learning and strategy. And the other one is uh, Siddharth Gupta, uh, the CEO of Mercer Metal. Welcome to the Fireside Chat, uh, Siddharth and Professor Jose. Thank you. Good morning, Durga. Good morning, Siddharth. It's a pleasure to be talking to you, and I look forward to an interesting conversation. Same here, with Durga. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, uh, Professor Joe's always a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, good afternoon to everybody who's listening to us. All right. All right. Let's get started. So the first question. Let me get started with you, Professor Joe's. Um, uh, so can you please tell us about your role in IAM Bangalore and how? technology is being adopted in this uh, in the institution so good morning once again to all of you um, i teach strategy at iam bangalore i'm a professor of strategy i also chair the area and um, currently my role is that of the chairperson of digital learning uh, which is iamb's initiative into digital learning we call it iambx and uh, where we offer courses on edX, on Swayam, and on our own, our own open edX platform in which we have some partnerships with Metal and AWS. IAMB was one of the first schools to embrace technology in all its forms. And our foray into MOOCs is just an extension of that. In about five years, a third of our faculty are offering MOOCs and um, we have about 1.4 million registered learners spread across 180 countries, fully a third of whom are from India. So my role is basically to facilitate um, these activities, uh, you know, and uh, make sure that uh, we come up with new courses and new programs which meet the needs of people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Professor uh, Sanchidad, can you also talk about uh, Metal and your journey with Metal? Thank you so much, Durga. I was suddenly scared that uh, I'm a professor now. <laughs> <laughs> For listeners uh, who don't know Mercer Metal, uh, we are an online assessment platform, uh, talent measurement experts uh, who have the ability to curate and administer online assessments, uh, which can measure uh, all buckets of competencies, whether it is knowledge on a particular subject, skill. We have certain simulators for testing that, personality as well as behavior. But our genesis is rooted in India's uh, startup culture. Metal was founded in India nine years back. One of our founders is actually an alum of uh, IAM Bangalore and an ex-student of uh, Professor Joe. So 
this is a special moment for us. Uh, great to be here. Uh, in 2018, we got acquired by Mercer. Mercer is, as you know, one of the largest HR consulting company. So uh, uh, great to be part of that family. We work with, uh, you know, this is one of our biggest uh, well, well kept secret is uh, we work with nearly 100 plus education institutes who use our platform to conduct uh, exams with the same amount of authenticity as required. So we help uh, educational setups uh, conduct entrance exams, quizzes, semester exams and final exams as well. A very, very prestigious set of uh, names. Uh, I am Bangalore uh, is one. Uh, Indian School of Business, Narsi Monji, SP Jain, I could rattle off a host of uh, very, very prestigious institutes who use us. We are also on AWS, so great to be a partner uh, to you, Durga. Uh, for me personally, uh, I've been part of the Mercer Metal Leadership for the last four years, so I've very closely seen the transition from uh, being a very small startup to a to one of the largest uh, online assessment companies in India as well as in the world. Uh, it's been a great journey. Currently, I'm in the role of CEO at Mercer Metal. All right, great. Uh, thank you, Siddharth. Um, yes, it's always a pleasure to work with you as a partner on this. Um, so let's get started on the, the topic today on the continuity um, of maintaining continuity in examinations and learning. So if you really look at the disruption on education today, uh, this is an unprecedented time and everyone is impacted individually across industries and countries. So the question to you, Siddharth, is um, you know, what's going to be the impact of this disruption on overall education industry within our country as well as globally? What's your viewpoint? Thanks, Durga. So uh, I think uh, all, all of us have seen uh, within few weeks uh, that the policymakers uh, saw the kind of impact this virus can have on the society at large we had large scale shutdowns across uh, places where mass gathering uh, is, is a norm i think education setups uh, saw schools and higher eds completely shut down quickly and uh, the worst uh, part of the news uh, for most educators is we don't know the open date yet so uh, all policymakers all of us are seeing whether uh, this particular curve can be flattened and when will it be uh, risk-free for us to bring in uh, the next generation into the classrooms back. Some experts have uh, uh, tried to uh, approximate the impact. I think about 1.5 billion learners across nearly 188 countries seem to be already uh, under a lockdown, so they are not able to continue with their learning. I personally believe uh, this is not the last of uh, crisis that uh, this particular ecosystem is facing because I think this virus has uh, taught us many things. I think policymakers have realized the cost of uh, being late to react is, is huge, huge. So it, it's something that uh, they would keep in mind. And uh, if there is any iota of a scare as well, which comes in uh, in the next two to three years, you would find uh, policymakers quickly uh, shutting down places where we, we could put people at risk. So uh, I think uh, education setups don't have a choice. We were already moving in the direction. Uh, I think uh, like I am Bangalore, I think many progressive education setups were already investing in going online and making learning available 24 into 7 to their learners. But I think this would get accelerated. India, though, uh, beyond the uh, education ecosystem problem, we have a larger problem. We also have a digital divide. Uh, if you just drive out 100 kilometers from larger cities uh, and even maybe come a few notches down the economic strata, you would find that uh, the devices uh, are not there at home, uh, which can assist a, a good learning environment. Uh, we don't have connectivity, which is as robust. We have improved quite a bit in the last two to three years, but we are still not there plus the sophisticated setups like studios that you need for learner for teachers to train and create good quality content also is something where uh, i think india is lacking right now so uh post covid last two to three months what we have seen is many institutes have started experimenting with online formats uh, we get requests a lot of requests every day uh, that they're, they're attempting web-based app-based tv-based learning I feel this is only going to get accelerated in the next uh, few months. Yeah, I, I agree on that. So, in fact, uh, the, in, this disruption is actually pushing us so much that the people are actually thinking innovatively to see how do they actually look at continuing that learning, continuing that uh, the classroom experience in different ways. Um, 
Yeah. So coming to you, Professor Joes, uh, how has it actually impacted IAM Bangalore, uh, the disruption today? So Durga, before I answer that question, I just want to add one or two points to what Siddharth mentioned. And I think this is a, you know, for instance, he talked about 1.5 billion people out of schools. And if you look at the Indian numbers, you know, there's about 320 million out of schools, of which uh, wow. 143 million in primary sector, 133 in secondary and tertiary education is 34 million. Now, what this means is that two or three points, maybe three points really worth highlighting there. One, as Siddharth mentioned, there's huge uncertainty. So the question is, not just when will we return to business as usual, it is more like, will there be ever a business as usual post COVID-19? Uh, and that relates to whether we have seen the last of this, I don't think so. I think we are looking at disruptions coming periodically uh, over at least the next one year, probably two years. So that's the increased uncertainty and we are not sure what to do. The second I think is the huge disruption in academic schedules, uh, not just the way uh, you know, conducting classes, but exams, particularly entrance exams and so on need to be rescheduled. And that, of course, is going to be a problem uh, for people studying in India. Of course, in a perverse way, the fact that the whole world is impacted is comforting for those planning to study abroad because their schedules everywhere would be impacted. The third, I think, is yeah. the challenge faced by those, um, you know, completing education. In other words, uh, you know, people have plans, career plans, and so on. Everything is on a hold for the moment. In a way, I think this means that higher oh. education will see a rise in enrollments, and that will certainly be helpful. But coming back to IIMB more specifically, I think we were more lucky in the sense that our terms had concluded and you know, our, some of our interviews were over and so on. But generally speaking, the impacts are same across the board, even if you're not from an IIM or a top B school or whatever. In a, in a change model, you would find that uh, you know, the hallmarks of maybe institutions like IIMB, which is a learning model or the, or the pedagogy, are compromised. We have generally prided ourselves on, you know, the pedagogy we use, case discussions, group work, intensive faculty student interaction in the classroom and so on. All of that needs to change. And the lockdown also forced us, like many other institutes, to cancel several programs, uh, defer certain others, and in some cases, we continue to teach using digital means. But frankly, the disruption is huge. For instance, as a last point, you know, summer internships are an important part of both engineering and MBA curriculum. The lockdown extending, mm -hmm. we're not sure whether this will have to be curtailed or abandoned. And there are many such situations. Okay. Yeah. So can you also talk about how is it actually impacting the faculties and students in general? Okay. So as I said before, the Our learning model and pedagogy. May I? Yeah. Yes. So as I said before, yeah, please go ahead. both the learning model and the pedagogy are changing. That means business as usual is not possible. So let's take it from a student's perspective. You can digitalize education or you can do some distance learning models, but there are severe limits to homeschooling. Because education is not just about learning concepts and writing exams. It is also a process of socialization. And that socialization will only happen in a brick and mortar context where people talk to each other. Of course, socialization is possible in other ways, but it's not exactly the same. So there is one challenge of that, that the way people learn will now change and both the institutions, that means the faculty and the students have to adapt to that. Of course, you know, in, in, in a way you think some students will also benefit, consider an all pass scenario, which many uh, state governments have considered. Uh, but from an institutional perspective, there are several challenges. And I think the first one is, or the first three are infrastructure, 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 really, if you think about it. You know, Siddharth mm -hmm. mentioned about it, connectivity is poor, devices are not there, institutional infrastructure may not be amenable uh, to going to a digital way. The second, I think, is related to competence. Uh, and this is, you know, teaching in a digital format is going to be very different than teaching in, the, in a face-to-face -face format. So we will need to redesign curriculum. We'll have to redesign delivery. And I'm not sure that 
uh, we are all uh, really up to speed on that. And I think the third is to understand that there's there requires to be a change of mindset. Often, you know, both faculty and students perceive digital to be, let's say, somewhat inferior to face-to-face -face meetings in the classroom. I agree mm -hmm. that there are trade-offs, but there are also important advantages that digital gives us. But you know, this is you know, such as you can do in a self-paced mode or pace it the way you like or asynchronous and so on. Especially in a in a lockdown situation, this is particularly good. Um, but of course, this is a mindset that faculty need to change. So in other words, what I guess I'm trying to say is digital can substitute some parts of education, but not all. And what is difficult to substitute is a socialization process. You can't substitute that with digital learning tools. And then, of course, there are other issues today. Uh, for instance, many of us use Zoom and there have been security issues and so on. So there is always a question about privacy and, uh, you know, we are really not equipped to deal with all of that. So those are some of the big challenges. Okay. Yeah, I think I think you rightly said digital can substitute or complement, but cannot replace all from a classroom experience point of view. Um, thank you. Uh, so, so let's talk about challenges specifically uh, or more in general from an education institution, not necessarily about IAM Bangalore, uh, are facing due to the disruption. You know. Um, so again, the, the question to you, Professor Jose. I know you touched upon this already in my previous question, but in general, if you look at whether it is schools or colleges or higher ed, what are the challenges for these classrooms or completing of these courses? Yeah, so Durga, I think a couple of things actually. One, of course, Siddharth mentioned, it is a lack of, uh, you know, devices. We often, often tend to assume that, you know, everybody has access to, um, you know, devices or everybody has access to some good bandwidth and so on across the country. But despite the Digital India story, the reality is there's a huge digital divide. And so mm -hmm. I sometimes wonder that if, you know, if we go into digital more extensively, we might just be increasing that digital divide um, because people in remote rural areas will not have access to uh, you know, good education and they will be, that access will be prevented. Just to give you an example, a small institution that I know of, uh, which asked the incoming class uh, whether they would be willing to go with, um, you know, digital classes, online classes. I think, you know, maybe about, um, of a class of maybe about 600, uh, more than 100 people said they were in locations which did not have uh, good bandwidth access. So that's one big challenge. The other is, I think, anything we do, we will have to scale up at a low cost. If this means investing huge amounts of money in infrastructure or in retraining people, you know, retraining would take time uh, and we don't really have the money to put high in infrastructure. So we have to create very low cost scaling up opportunities. The third, I think, is one classic problem of, you know, it's not a problem, it's a challenge with digital. How do, you know, while digital increases reach, it might decrease richness of the content. It might, I'm not saying it always is the case. Uh, but then therefore, uh, you know, in making this transition, people have to really look at, you know, both reach and re richness because both are parts of, two parts of extending education. So those are some challenges. But on the other hand, there are some, you know, really good opportunities. Uh, Digital allows us, you know, technology, let's say, allows us to magnify the resources. So we do not have so many good faculty. Uh, so we could really broadcast their classes and so on. It works in certain subjects. It does not work in other subjects. If you're teaching sciences, you need a lab. And we don't really yeah. have lab facilities. So those are some of the challenges that will still be there. And I think the other challenge is, you know, just like the digital divide, there is a generation gap between generally the faculty who deliver uh, you know, education and students who are literally digital natives. So they might not be on the same page. I think we have to learn a lot from our children to be better teachers. Thank you. <laughs> yes, 
Yeah, absolutely. No, I think you very well said. Uh, thank you, Professor Jose. In fact, I think even this is a time where Feb, March, April timeframe where there are a lot of examinations happen. There are a lot of semester examination that happen. Um, and a lot of these entrance exams happen at the, across the board. So even those have been impacted a lot, right? Um, so I think that's going to be another challenge, especially in when these semester examinations are in place, how is it going to happen? Uh, so I actually want to ask this question to Siddharth, but before that, uh, Professor Jos, can you just talk about IMDX uh, point of view? Uh, can you give me more information about it? What does IMBX so, uh, does? So the IMBX was, you know, IMB's experiment with um, online education, but online education in the MOOCs mm -hmm. format, which is massive open online courses. And this started about five years okay. ago when um, MIT and Harvard, along with a few other Ivy League institutions in the US, decided to get into massive open online courses. And IMB was invited okay. to be a part of it. And that's when we, we got in. There were a lot of challenges for, we were not really familiar with, um, uh, you know, adapting education to the MOOCs format. But I'm really glad to say that our faculty have adopted this really well. As a result of which we now have about 40 courses spread across wow. three platforms and which is actually quite uh, quite popular um, and i think on the way we've learned quite a lot in terms of what is it that you know how should one transform the conventional way of delivering into a, a more more based digital mode of delivery there has been a lot of learnings and we've learned actually from you, AWS, and we've learned from Metal and several other partners in the way classes need to be conducted, uh, in the way faculty needs to be engaging, because in an online space, uh, the engagement models are very, very different. The student can just switch you off and walk away, and you would not be any wiser for it. Uh, and of course, faculty have the challenge of speaking to a, a computer or a camera, which we are not very familiar with, and so on. So those challenges we are still trying to deal with. But you know, I think what I can say is that we've had reasonable success as a result of which um, now we work with several schools and we uh, do several faculty development programs, which is one of our key activities. Uh, so for instance, in the last three years, we have done about 16 faculty development programs to train faculty uh, to create MOOCs or uh, Use, teach using MOOCs in a blended format, which is a hybrid of an online uh, you know, course and face-to-face -face meeting. So those are the things we do. Uh, IMBX also uh, does a, you know, an international conference called the Future of Learning, and I invite all of you to be part of it. Three rounds okay. are over. And it is, it's a place where we try to bring in um, technologies, entrepreneurs, educationists, policymakers, and corporate learning uh, heads into one space if with, without any you know, platform related agenda. In other words, it's platform agnostic, technology agnostic. It's only looking at pedagogy. It's looking at the future, how technology is evolving uh, and technology and delivery evaluation and all of that stuff. And then it uh, tries to bring together people and you know, both practitioners and policy makers to see how you know, we can improve our educational system and create new models going ahead. Because uh, my own perspective on this is that uh, the nature of educational institutions will change in the future. And what we need is collaborations, like the one we are now talking about. So in that space, yeah. we need to be talking to each other and the, the conference plays a very big role in that. So those are some of the activities. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Jose. I will definitely look forward to that feature of learning one uh, this year if it is coming. Um, thank you for that. So uh, Siddharth, the question to you, I'm gonna take one step back on the topic that we started, uh, which is on the ground challenges that institutions face. So in general, uh, what are some of the other on the ground challenges that education uh, you know, customers in India is currently facing? So Durga, I think um, Professor Jose has been uh, fairly comprehensive in his answers. I think uh, if you look India specific, uh, the digital divide is a reality. Uh, but I, I'll go into 
couple of areas where uh, you know we have had on ground uh, experience one broad generalizations there are few exceptions we have a very prestigious education setups who are ahead of the learning curve but if i mm -hmm. need to uh, put in one uh, one uh, sentence ability to go online uh, for most of the edu entities is lagging behind what technology allows today uh, and maybe it was the economics of it of adopting a very high uh, highly immersive learning or virtual classroom technology or an assessment technology which can allow you to assess students more accurately and do it uh, from anywhere uh, despite them being remote so all these technologies have been in the in the uh, been available to the uh, education ecosystem but the adoption has been a bit slow i think that is something which is uh, impacting most of the education setups today that i think is going to get corrected now because uh, now we don't have an option of not having a lockdown so the economics of it will work out uh, both ways uh, second is i think uh, the it setups of most of the education uh, institutes was not to the level where they need to be to manage the scale that they're addressing so if you look at mm -hmm. most of the most of the larger universities they would have thousands of students and uh, the IT team would be a very, very thin layer. I think so IT team uh, strength as well as their capabilities is something that is across the board we feel is under invested in. Plus the uh, trainings uh, or the trainers being trained to use these technologies where the adoption is effective, uh, both in terms of uh, virtual classrooms being conducted or the students being uh, well measured on the impact of that education. So I think these are the two or three things that we see as on ground challenges in the education sector, not only in India, but across. And uh, this particular uh, pandemic and the life that we are going to have post this, even during the recovery phase, I think the education ecosystem would completely transform and they would lean a lot towards technology to solve for many of these problems and I think uh, what IMBX with the under the guidance of Professor Joes have been able to do they've been able to give a template uh, that uh, you know various players can come together uh, you could have an open source platform where you could upload all kinds of different content uh, and you could have a good quality immersive learning experience for people sitting anywhere who have access to the internet and then post that you could conduct uh, highly authentic assessments as well so that you are confident that you you uh, you know the person who's supposed to take the assessment is taking it and also he's not using any unfair means to take the assessment so you are you have an exact measure of uh, of the not only the learning outcome but also of the uh, uh, the credibility of the entire exam process what I see as a positive outcome, Durga and uh, Professor Pios, out of this is uh, there are capabilities uh, that the technology would bring forth to the education ecosystem, which was not there earlier or at least not utilized earlier. For example, we know we have a massive shortage of very, very highly skilled and very effective uh, trainers. Uh, they are in these premier colleges like I am Bangalore and the IITs of the world. And uh, uh, now they can take a larger course people can listen to them and take classes from anywhere plus we could also have the same uh, level of authentic certifications uh, which can be now being open to a larger ecosystem which cannot come to a campus and do, do these assessments or they cannot afford to uh, you know uh, enroll for a uh, you know go out of their work completely and enroll for a two-year program or a three-year program so i think technology would also enable and usher in a lot of improvement in the in the education ecosystem going forward awesome yeah thank you so much i think you not only talked about the the challenges on the ground but you also talked about some of the opportunities wherein how technology can fill the gap but also complement and take it beyond just what is not possible um you know on the ground and quickly possible today so yeah thank you for that so that um so speaking about technology um and professor joe's uh, this question to you i know you talked a lot about the iamx um uh, program and the future of learning and then how the course were the 40 courses in three different platform and how those 16 uh, faculties have been developed and all that that's a great stuff um so 
along with this IMBX, can you also talk about how the technology revolutionized the, the so-called learning strategy for overall IAM Bangalore? Because you talked about that third of uh, online learners today for IAM Bangalore are actually outside of India. So very curious to know about how that's uh, happening. So Dukha, the first thing is that, uh, you know, we as faculty realized our inadequacies because you can be a great teacher in a classroom, uh, but that's a very different kettle of fish when you teach online in a MOOC format, in a asynchronous mode. Uh, the students have the opportunity to switch you off at any point of time. So we had to devise ways and means, and these are not original, I must admit, but we had to devise ways and means to keep learner engagement very high. Uh, which we do in a standard MOOC format by giving exercises. We did some innovations. We did um, online simulations and various other uh, methods. We did you know, some kind of hybridization of blended classes. All of these are ways to keep um, the student community engaged. Of course, if you have several thousands of learners, the challenge is so much more. And then of course, um, while scaling up is possible, uh, the engagement levels can come down. So, so this is a challenge that I think every everyone who is online is facing, and we are also facing. Uh, but on the other hand, we also found, and this is what my faculty colleagues have been telling me, that when they uh, while they didn't have to improvise and adjust in the online mode, they found that uh, this experience significantly improved their own classroom experience when they came back to class in the pre-COVID era, so to say. So there has been a learning back and forth. Uh, and I think uh, the biggest uh, learning for us is that we are now being challenged, not in a small pond, so to say. You know, everybody says IAMs and IITs are good because our benchmarks are, you know, very few institutions that we are familiar with. But today, if you're talking about a student in a global context, and the student could be from India, uh, these courses and faculty are benchmarked against the best in the world. So therefore, there is yeah. a incentive for us to up our game, uh, which I think was not there so much before. You know, mm -hmm. students were happy to get into an IAM, then, you know, they automatically assume or an IIT or whichever is the institution. They just assume that they got the best, but today they, can, they have access to various other courses elsewhere and so on. So there's a bit of challenge for us also. I think all of this has improved the learning environment significantly for us. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much in those insights, uh, Professor Jose. Um, just to let everyone know, I think there are some great questions coming up. If you have any more questions, keep them sent, uh, keep them coming. Uh, instead of 15 minutes, I'm trying to see if I can actually, you know, ask more questions of these from uh, audience. Uh, to the uh, panelists here. I would do that. Let me uh, ask one more question and I'll come back to uh, picking up these Q&A much early and we'll mix uh, both of them. I think that's how we would do. Um, so the next question to Siddharth. Uh, Siddharth, can you talk about um, how can institutions leverage technology like online uh, and a proctoring or remote proctoring and like any sort of tools that are there for examinations uh, in order to ensure this continuity in education and uh, you know course completions. Yeah, absolutely, Durga. So uh, I think one of the uh, biggest concerns uh, uh, any trainer or any reputed institute has today is whether uh, the, uh, string, uh, the 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 seriousness with which they conduct their exams and they really guarantee uh, a learning outcome. Uh, and and it's the quality of their student which uh, which carries the brand forward. So I think uh, assessments have a very key role to play, and uh, especially when we are talking about going digital uh, in in the post COVID environment, I think uh, it is important for us to understand uh, how online assessments uh, can not only be scaled, but how they can be made more authentic. And I think that's something that we are experts in. Uh, we have been. Uh, conducting nearly 70,000 assessments on our platform a day. And out of that, uh, nearly about 70% of that, so about 49 to 50,000 assessments are remote proctored. 
So remote proctored is uh, our, our industry's parlance for remote invigilation. And by remote invigilation, we mean it could be an AI based algorithm that could ensure that uh, the assessment is being conducted in the right manner, or it could be an AI assisted human proctored. So it could be a professor who wants to give a quiz or to run his own uh, semester exam, and he could be assisted by an AI algorithm which uh, which allows him to online uh, remotely invigilate his entire class, uh, like a like a set of tiles, 40 tiles that he has, and it has a score in terms of the credibility index or number of digressions that the student has tried to uh, try during the assessment exam. So so everything that we uh, are are assured in a classroom based assessment can be gotten onto the platform uh, of Metal. We are, as you know, hosted on the Amazon platform, so we can render these assessments anywhere uh, on the cloud and people can access these assessments from any device as well. So you could be sitting at home if you have a laptop with a webcam, which mostly all laptops, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the last five years have got a basic webcam capability. So these assessments can be then accessed by the students sitting anywhere and uh, we can manage scale so as i said uh, you know about 70000 but we've hit a peak of nearly 150000 assessments a day on our platform so wow. the technology is there uh, the i'll spend a couple of minutes on other things that might look like uh, uh, an impediment uh, for going online with assessments uh, the the uh, the aspect which is which uh, you know takes away the bandwidth from a professor which is you know, I have taught a class. If I give quizzes, I need to sit and mark those quizzes as well. Now, uh, you know, these test engines come with ability to auto grade as well. So if we work with professors deep enough, we could understand what learning outcomes they want to measure. And then we could actually create a blueprint or a question paper, which can then have a grading logic, which is baked into the test engine itself. So as soon as a student presses the finish button, the uh, the grade of that particular student gets flashed to the professor so so many things in in a way are also can be automated and and improved as we go uh, uh, you know digital in terms of learning and uh, as well as um, you know assessments uh, we currently take about 26 different types of question formats so one is going online with as is so i would just put up the questions and these are long answer type questions and then I want access to the answer sheets online and I want to mark them. That could be one process. But uh, uh -huh. we have baked in nearly 26 different types of question formats in the test engine itself so that we can automate and assess the trainer as much as possible in increasing scale and his effectiveness and accuracy in terms of measuring his people. The last bit Durga, is on the on the AI algorithm. So this is an AI algorithm that we've written and we have trained it over nearly 2.8 million proctored assessments, which can actually through a webcam ensure that the student who's taking the test uh, cannot uh, digress or cannot use unfair means. So it has all the bells and whistles in terms of not allowing you to, uh, uh, you know, move away from the screen. Uh, it doesn't allow you a phone in hand. It doesn't allow you a book in hand. Uh, it, it, it there are there are ways and means uh, to ensure that if a test is running on the laptop, nothing else can be uh, you know done on that particular laptop. We have ways and means of blocking if somebody is accessing any other web source uh, or trying to replicate the screen. So there are about 16 to 17 digressions that we have noted over the last seven to eight years, and we have trained this AI uh, based algorithm to detect those. And uh, the beauty is before any test, because all tests are not at the same level of authenticity, we can actually sit with the trainer and bake in the credibility aspects of that exam as well. So we can make it unique for that quiz. So quiz might be an easier one. Entrance exam would be high authenticity. Semester exam would be a bit higher than quizzes. And then maybe final exams could be very high. So you know this, uh, this credibility can be built into the entire assessment process very easily, very easy to use and completely online. So from an assessment standpoint, uh, we are experts. I know I've done a lot of uh, you know uh, reading on learning as well, but I'm not an expert on learning. But I know that technology is available for us to completely move the institutions, the trainers, and the learners uh, onto an assessment platform, which can cater to and actually improve 
their earlier experience of assessment. So technology is there though, okay. which can be adopted and it is available at a price point of a SaaS. So, uh, you know, we are on Amazon, we are a SaaS offering. There are multiple such offerings which are available for people to use and uh, move quickly in this direction. There, there's no very large investment needed for you to move your class online. Okay, so in fact, uh, I have a few more questions I wanted to ask uh, Professor Joes, but I'm going to hold on to those questions till the, the final five minutes, okay? I really wanted to get into the Q&A because there is one question which came up and I felt that's a nice segue, we can get into this Q&A. So, uh, in fact, there's one question asked about the same topic which you just covered, which is um, online proctoring, right? You said, I think it's coming from Mr. Jabbar Mirza. Uh, so we don't have proper monitoring as they are writing remotely. So they may copy from Google or they may contact with other peers. So I think you covered a lot on these 8 million assessments and you know with webcams and don't allow phones. Can you at least emphasize one more minute on anything else that you want to cover on this question? Sure, Durga. So, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so Durga, uh, you know, I spoke about uh, the level of authenticity you want to bring into every assessment experience. So for example, uh, you know, a, a trainer is taking a class and it's a basic quiz that he wants to give to his class. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is not a grade that matters a lot, but he just wants to check whether the students got the concept that he's been training on. And uh, that exam uh, authenticity level is not very high, but we can still switch it on uh, to make sure that at least an AI based algorithm ensures that people are not crowding together and trying to answer the question that he's posed to the entire class. So in that case, uh, through the web camera, uh, we keep we not only record uh, the uh, uh, the screen. So we're looking at the screen at which the student is uh, spending time and how much how many minutes is he spending time on a particular question we also look at him and the ai would actually measure whether he's looking away or he's referring to a book or he's trying to look for something in the phone uh, there are many such digressions which a student might attempt for example he might try and open a web browser and quickly google an answer to give to his professor so we can actually allow or limit number of times we can actually make it zero as well so depending on the authenticity that you want to build in this is the basic level of authenticity that we can bring in wherein an AI is monitoring the quiz, for example. Now, if we now go next notch on authenticity, we uh, if I'm a professor and I'm taking an entrance exam for my course or I'm doing a certification, final certification exam for my course, I want an environment where nobody can plug in anything uh, to the laptop. I don't want the student to leave the screen for two hours while he's attempting the uh, exam. And uh, I don't want him to have any access to any web browser. I don't have. I don't want uh, him to have access to any duplicate screen where people might be looking in and trying to help him out. I also want to know what kind of audio environment is he sitting in. So all of this can be monitored by the AI, and in real time, the professor would be getting against the screen of the student would be getting a a, a flag in case the student is trying to attempt something, uh, which is not allowed to. So, so by ways and means of using technology, we can actually increase the authenticity to the level which is required uh, for different types of exams. And uh, uh, you know, uh, I can speak about metal. We have done uh, for nearly hundred odd entities exams at all levels. So there are there are mm. entities which for semester exams for distance learning. We do a lot of work around entrance exams for. Uh, courses for very uh, you know very prestigious universities we also work very closely with many professors uh, to help them run quizzes uh, uh, rapid quick quizzes in succession with their team while they are training we also have now made grounds in the schools where schools are now using our assessment to make sure that uh, the training uh, the the classrooms that uh, they are conducting uh, the they are followed with quizzes and assessment so depending on uh, the nature of the exam you want to conduct there is technology available and it is available on cloud it it doesn't need you to download anything onto the laptop so it's a very uh, very very SaaS, a very very google kind or aws kind experience where everything is available on the cloud for you to use and automate your okay. assessment thank you Siddharth. that's a very um elaborate answer that's good so, so the way if i may ask yeah, please Sorry. go ahead. Sir. I just wanted to add a useless perspective. Um, 
and I want to say that I'm saying it of my own accord. Uh, we do work with a number of institutions. We work with TCS. I know Pearson Learning has some, uh, you know, some assessment technologies and so on. And we work very closely with Metal. And I can endorse everything that Siddharth said because we've used Metal's platform uh, for assessing our online, you know, online programs, evaluating. Uh, we've used it for several other cases, including evaluating it for uh, some of our admission processes, internal HR processes, and so on. And uh, so that is absolutely right. It gives a great level of authenticity to the exam. And, uh, you know, it gives us a great deal of assurance internally also uh, that the certifications we do are, you know, uh, and the grades we give are actually um, well deserved. So I completely agree with that. And I have to tell you, I'm not asked to endorse Metal, but certainly uh, Metal is doing a great job of that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. So just one question while you are at it. Uh, so just one very general question came up. Uh, when you were talking, you said digital can not be a substitution to a classroom experience. So it can substitute to some, but will not uh, for everything. However, there is one question came up saying, uh, isn't digital education a kind of a brave new world? And like many ways going to impact education, say invention of paper or printing had done in the past. Don't you think that this is actually a brave new world that could probably substitute? It's a really good question. And I think it's a brave new world, but um, you don't have to you know, abandon the old world. Why I'm mentioning this is digital offers some advantages which face-to-face -face may actually not offer. For instance, you can get great insight into student learning patterns in digital. Uh, because we can track every second of their activity, which is not possible uh, in the real world. Frankly, in a class of 90 people, you can't track everybody. Digital gives you huge flexibility and, you know, especially, you know, in terms of pace of learning, timing and all of that. And digital allows you to have a memory over a student's lifetime from maybe kindergarten to graduation and promotes yeah. lifelong learning. All of these are absolute advantages and we should leverage on this. However, what digital does not do, I think, in my opinion, not, and of course, you can use several AI tools to, um, uh, you know, improve the quality of experience and so on. However, what it does not do, I think, in my opinion, as of now, is it does not provide the socialization process. You don't actually go to a college just to learn from a professor. You learn to go, uh, you learn from your peers, you learn from the context. There's a cultural uh, underpinning to education. A lot of that is missed out in digital. And I don't think we want people to be individualists sitting in front, in front of a computer, no matter how smart they are. We want people to work in teams, work with others and so on. And those skills, uh, you know, are actually not so amenable to digital learning, I think. That's my personal opinion. And I think things will change. Okay. Things will improve. And this brings yeah, me I more with you. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Professor, uh, because uh, there was a saying, um, in fact, there's observation that uh, all these self-paced learning uh, where folks are individually and voluntarily subscribing, people who are subscribed and the percentage of people who are actually completing it is significantly lower. Okay, and there is, I think, almost more than 90% dropout uh, in the uh, self-paced learning and how they're going to complete them. Whereas the, the digital classroom-based learning, the percentage is on the other side, uh, where at least 90% success rate is there. But you still see the 10%. So I don't think that there's going to be a, a flip thing where it's going to go in one way and then everything else will come in other. I think there is always a, a transformation phase and there is a phase in which one generation will keep learning and the new generation will keep pushing from the other side and at some way it's going to merge there. And can I make a quick point to the okay. point that you made, Durga? Just one I'm quick sorry? point. Can I make a quick yeah. point on what you said? Yeah, See, a lot of people say that the completion rates are very poor in digital. I think uh, that's not fair comparison. The reason mm -hmm. being, um, you know, many times I have registered to a number of courses, but I, you know, I just want a certain part of it. I don't need a certificate. And therefore, while I register, yeah. I don't complete. I only look at the parts I want. And the registrations are huge in millions. So you would expect even 5% of 
five percent, you know, actually three to four percent completion rates are what people are talking about. Uh, that's also a huge number. So there is that's one part of it. The other part of it is what we find in our own platform is that when people pay for education, they do complete it. So if you look at IIMBX, which is in our own close, you know, instance of open edX, we find 100% completion rates. Whereas, mm. whereas if you look at, you know, our courses on edX, we find maybe maybe 4% completion rate. But they're very different uh, things to compare. Mm. And I think um, so. One okay. must take note of that. So it's more of a learners have the different objectives, not necessarily about the completion of a course. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So let me ask this question to Siddharth, the next one. Um, how this platform, your platform, can help with semester exams where uh, quantitative subjects, writing formulas uh, like that, like how does it kind of help there in the proctoring? Thanks, Do you want Dugas. to take that question? Yeah, absolutely, Durga. So uh, I think there are two aspects of um, uh, the way assessments are conducted. One is if we are able to uh, curate the blueprint or the test in a way that questions can come in in formats where we can bake a grading logic to it. So the machine can grade it and you can very quickly, so multiple choice that we all have taken assessments uh, even to get into IAMs. Uh, those are those kind of multiple choice questions. So, so then a grading logic can be built behind the test. And the moment you take the test, then your uh, report could be instantly generated because the machine's calculating the grades for you. The other aspect is long answer type questions, wherein uh, there is, for example, a hypothesis given and you're supposed to write a bunch of equations and make a diagram and things like that. So uh, the uh, test platform actually allows you for that as well. But then all of us would agree that it's very difficult for us to, uh, uh, you know, make a grading logic to it. Uh, we could maybe check uh, if it's pure English, we could check grammar and, and flow and things like that. Uh, uh, and relevance as well to the topic. But overall, it would be a block of response that will come in from the applicant, uh, from the student. And that needs to be graded by uh, a professor. So we would then in our report uh, online allow the professor to come in and uh, grade that uh, question and give his marks uh, to the student for that as well as his comment. So we've in, in that scenario, we've kind of copied the way things are done as is so that the uh, adoption can be accelerated. Okay, thank you so much. Um, all right, so the next question is uh, to uh, both of you, but I'm gonna just ask Siddharth to pick it up first um, because on the, this is like the main challenges of the digitization is the connectivity. And of course, bandwidth cost to the student and conduct an assessment of descriptive examination. So how to deal with these? It's talking about connectivity, bandwidth cost to the student, conducting assessments of these descriptive examinations, how to deal with these things is the question. So I think uh, uh, I could speak about connectivity. So uh, we work with the government of India. Uh, we are a close partners to them, I think with AWS on delivering the uh, uh, digital Shakshartha mission project wherein we work in 600 odd districts in very remote corners where uh, people take uh, a digital literacy certificate out of very old uh, desktops with a webcam on top of it. So uh, we have the technology which can compress uh, data quite a bit and the uh, amount of uh, you know bandwidth needed for these assessments is not very high. So I don't think it's gonna put a very huge cost onto uh, the student from a perspective of just the assessments. Uh, obviously, if it's a live virtual classroom, then it would be uh, are far heavy, but the assessments don't take that much of uh, bandwidth uh, for, for it to pinch a student. Uh, what was the second part of the question, Durga? Uh, the connectivity was- so, Yeah, second part of- Yeah, so I think the conducting and assessments of the descriptive examinations, how to deal with those? Yeah, so I think uh, there would be some amount of change management there. Uh, I know that students are fairly comfortable in writing uh, or typing their answers now. I have a 15 year old and she takes uh, exams online now because of the lockdown. So I've seen her type and uh, it's exhaustive in a way because they're used to writing uh, on answer sheets, but uh, 
you know i think uh, both the trainers as well as the applicants uh, need to adopt to uh, the the newer ways of uh, things happening around and i think uh, uh, you know all kind of functions all kind of equations everything uh, that you need to answer a particular question those symbols everything is available online it's just the habit of getting online and answering questions has to be built typing speed needs to be improved and i think these are things that would happen very quickly uh, if, if it's a younger lot that we're talking about okay all right yes understood thank you so uh, this question to professor joe's um uh, i think it's asked for both of them but i think let me ask professor joe's for his opinion and then before moving on to next question so the question was um you know how is the digital learning is to be adopted and what sort of resistance or challenges you experienced at iam at initial stage and how your team resolved those challenges so some of this i talked about durga before yeah. um, but you know the, the main challenge is really we as old school faculty are not willing to experiment with anything new and this is as much true of iams and iits as well as any other place uh, but uh, so that was the main thing but i think we did it more by demonstration that there are always a few people within the institute who are more enterprising and entrepreneurial in a way uh, they did courses and then um, you know by word of mouth and by demonstration others kind of joined in uh, but uh, the good thing about this was that once faculty got convinced so the people who did the first few courses came back to do more courses with us and so on uh, but to make this happen you need a very good uh, you know support system because at the end of the day the faculty is mostly concerned about teaching uh, they are not willing to invest so much of time in technology or in understanding technology or uh, videos or editing or you know how to structure a course online and then how to deliver it and all of that stuff so i think at iim we we had a very good team that took away all of this pain points from the faculty and we primarily told the faculty please come do your lecture we will help you redesign uh, the curriculum in a way that's digitally amenable so we had instructional designers and then we will convert these videos into um, digital learning assets so i think that really took away a lot of the pain points once you do that okay more and more people are willing to experiment with this okay interesting thank you thank you uh, prajesh uh, so the, uh, the, just one last Durga, question i want to ask there is yes durga can i just add uh, just one line to sure. what professor said? a uh, couple of ways that we have seen it work and become more effective to bring and uh, bring a buy in from various stakeholders including the professors is uh, to integrate with their existing systems uh, which is uh, uh, you know if they are used to working on say for example one of the more established lmss like blackboards and canvases or even their own legacy lms so what we try and do is we integrate that so that uh, the the uh, the professor still on his own system he writes his own questions and answers and he at a click of a button he could populate that into our systems and could create uh, a test and similarly once the candidate has taken the test the score can go back to his legacy system itself so there is as less learning required for him uh, is what we try and attempt so that uh, we have quicker adoption of the system so that's something that we could work as well because most systems are now lti based mostly mostly all systems talk through apis with each other so so we have the ability to integrate and make it happen okay great thank you siddharth uh just one last question i think this question is kind of coming from most people so i'm going to summarize it and ask like as it's my question and if you could answer that in maybe less than one minute from each of you uh, in order to save the time would be great um so the question is what are the parameters to decide on to choose which tool is best suitable for you on these you know digitalization or for examinations we could pick the examination or assessments part what parameters to decide and this question to professor jose first and then i'll take the opinion from siddharth as well okay i think uh, very quickly the most important criteria for us is that we do not want to compromise on the rigor of the assessment or the 
delivery of the program and exam integrity needs to be maintained because our reputation is built on that and people trust us so it should provide a very high degree of assurance for authenticity and uh, to what we do but in terms of evaluating it we look at it for flexibility and flexibility with you know the ability as that said the ability to integrate with existing systems if possible uh, it has to be cost effective uh, and it has to be easily scalable finally it has to be very safe and secure and maybe one last point that the amount of learning required should be minimal thank you okay thank you thanks sir and siddharth would you want to give your viewpoint on this I think uh, Durga. I think uh, Professor Joe spoke about most of it. I think the authenticity of the assessment is paramount because uh, if we uh, if we are not able to address that, then the efficacy of the entire assessment process itself uh, gets lost. And the other aspect is uh, examinations are a very here and now business. So even for example, if a virtual class gets disrupted for a minute, uh, the students wouldn't fret about it. But if an exam has to start at nine o'clock in the morning. It has to start at nine o'clock in the morning. If it is nine, uh, nine o'clock and one minute, then you have the student sweating over it that you know he is missing out on uh, his ability to answer questions. So the uh, ability uh, to scale to ensure that things are robust, secure, uh, as well as has all these uh, the technical capabilities to ensure it's authentic, I think is what needs to be uh, judged by whoever is taking a decision. Uh, it is a uh, it is a very here and now business, and it needs that much of uh, uh, seriousness when you are evaluating uh, various players. Okay, great, great. Thank you. I think with that, um, I think we come to the end of the session. So I'll take your final comments from each of you. But before that, just want to summarize. I think the way that the disruption is pushing this education institution is. Um, is remarkable in the way that the people are actually finding some innovative solutions like organizations who are prepared to be able to deliver these and even in the lockdown situation there is a continuity and the organizations which are um yet to find those solutions i think there are great ways you can actually pick and choose what tools and you can actually get started the students can still get benefited um uh, in uh, in those semester examinations or overall in the live classrooms as well um so with that um so i think it's best to ask um both professor jose and siddharth for their final comments before we close out uh, professor jose anything that you would want to uh, say you know, to leave the audience uh, as a final comments for this so first of all i want to thank you for giving me this opportunity and thank you for listening for so long i just want to say that um, you know there are challenges uh, we learn by doing and we will make mistakes, but that is the nature of the game. Also, I just want to <clears throat> say that maybe it's not pleasant to think of pain as a part of growth, but it's frequently that is the case. So we can see this disruption as a crisis and throw up our hands or see it as a challenge and seek opportunities. Maybe not very appropriate to mention in this context, or maybe it's appropriate. I don't know how far this is true, but people say that the Chinese word for crisis I don't know how it's pronounced. Translated literally means dangerous opportunity. So there's an opportunity mm -hmm. resident in every danger. I think we have to make this move uh, because in the post-COVID world, the world is going to be very different. If we don't adapt and adopt, we die. And therefore, um, you know, failing is not a problem. The real failure is not trying to adapt and adopt. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Professor Jose and Siddharth. Yeah. Professor Jose and uh, Durga, thank you so much, and all the viewers, uh, listeners as well. It's been great. Uh, just last comment, I think I agree with Professor Jose completely. Crisis is sometimes the best uh, best teacher. Uh, so I believe uh, very soon we'll realize education is an essential service as well, and uh, we have to address how we will be online 24 into 7 uh, and, and able to educate uh, our next generation. I think technology is available as well. Uh, it is just we need to marry the entire education ecosystem with what is available at the right price, as uh, uh, Professor Joe said. And and I hope the learning continues. And uh, to all the listeners, please be safe. And uh, let's see, uh, let's hope that we uh, you know we see each other on the other side very soon.
Great, thank you so much, uh, Professor Jose and uh, um, and so that that's a nice way to end. One is the mistakes do happen, but continue to try. Failure is okay, but to try and adoption uh, and adaptability are both are important in this state of the art. Hopefully this 25 million people who are in the lockdown phase are learners. Uh, at least some of them will be able to continue to learn due to this online and technology adoption. And with that, uh, I thank everyone for joining and really appreciate you taking time out and listening to this uh, knowledge sharing session. And thank you both. Thank you, Zulva. Thank you, Siddharth. And thank you, all the learners. Stay safe. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor Joseph and Dutta. Thank you. Bye.